Good day. My name is Nora, and I'll be your event specialist today. At this time, I'd like to welcome everyone to Fluke Electrical Measurement Safety Webinar. Please note that all lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise and that today's conference is being recorded. We will have a question and answer session at the end of today's presentation. You may submit questions at any time during today's presentation. Locate the Q&A panel on the lower right-hand side of your screen, type your question in the open area, and click Send to submit. We'll also be taking questions via the phone line, and instructions on how to do so will be given at the appropriate time. If you experience any technical difficulties during today's conference, please use, use the chat box to speak with me directly. Locate and click on the chat icon in the floating toolbar at the bottom of your screen to open the panel on the right-hand side of your screen. And you can also press star zero on your telephone keypad to be connected with an operator. It is now my pleasure to turn today's program over to speaker Corey Glassman. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Corey Glassman and thank you for the introduction. I'm the uh, corporate training manager for Fluke Corporation. I've been at Fluke now Gosh, coming up on almost 30 years, so <laughs> quite a long time. A uh, lot of experience with um, fluke products and also the electrical measurement safety program that we're going to be looking at today. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, several areas of electrical measurement safety that would concern you. Part of that is NFPA 70E, which is the standard for uh, electrical measurement safety uh, for the National Fire Protection Association, so we'll go over that. And that's the updated 2018 edition, which is updated every three years. Uh, we'll also be talking about IEC 61010-2, which is the International Electrotechnical Commission standard that guides Fluke in building products, and it also guides the user in what type of product should be used in what location, depending upon transients that you're likely to see. And uh, I know a lot about Fluke products, clearly, so if there are any questions about the products that we have, if I don't have that answer, we'll definitely get it for you. And today, at the end of the presentation, a giveaway. Everyone loves giveaways. So um, there is a Fluke T6-1000 electrical tester that will be given away to one lucky customer or a, a participant today in the, in the presentation at the end. So hang around uh, and that drawing will take place at that time. And again, if you have any questions, uh, please let us know. Industry estimates. So we've all heard about arc flash, arc blast, and we'll get into a little bit of detail. But according to CapShell, which is an international organization, uh, Fluke contracted with them some years ago to run an estimate around the U.S. in the number of arc flash incidents that occur every day in the U.S. Now this number is probably four or five years old, which only means that there are more incidents happening every single day. We're dealing with more energy in a lot of our buildings, in the infrastructure, in the industrial environment, any commercial environment. Uh, Three-phase energy uh, that we're using. Uh, we have larger motors, larger loads, and that leads to more unfortunate arc flash incidents. Now, there are ways that we can protect ourselves against these. But if you think about it, five to 10 arc flash incidents that occur every day in the U.S. alone, 77% of the recorded electrical injuries were due to arc flash incidents. And an arc flash incident takes literally microseconds to happen. Uh, 640, I believe it's 640 miles per hour that liquefied metal uh, can be projected away from a surface once an arc flash incident takes place. It literally liquefies the copper and the bus bars and all of your different contactors and pushes it out from the source in the blast uh, that penetrates even the best PPE clothing. So we're going to go over ways to protect yourself against that happening. And there are some pretty much close standards that people should follow. Someone once told me, this is very similar to standing before a loaded cannon every day that you go in front of the panel. 
And even if people are very experienced with it, accidents do happen. So you just need to be aware of that and protect yourself accordingly. Let's start out with shock. Uh, so shock is a little bit different. And shock can also lead, unfortunately, to electrocution and death. And what you'll see here is the amount of current that um, has probable effects on the human body, all starting with one milliamp of current, which is a very, very small amount of current uh, flowing through your body. And depending upon your body resistance, obviously if you're, if you're in water, it lowers the resistance values of your body, of your skin. And the epidermal layer, um, the outer layer of the skin, has a lot of resistance to the inside of the skin. So if you actually make a contact below the subdermal layer uh, or the dermal layer, it could actually contact more of that, uh, uh, the part of the body that would conduct. So uh, protecting yourself against this type of contact is essential. Now what you'll also see is there's also six to 16 milliamps of current. Again, a very, very small amount of current that's the painful shock and you begin to lose the muscular control. Um, and that's where you can have a fall danger and it's also referred to as let go range. And what that means is that if you touch that and you allow the current to pass through your body, it sort of forces your muscles to lock up and you cannot literally disconnect from that circuit. Uh, that circuit. So, um, that's why, for instance, if you see someone getting electrocuted, don't run over and try to grab them and pull them away from a circuit because then you yourself become part of that circuit. What you usually want to do is either grab something that is non-conductive. So uh, take something that's non-conductive and push them away from the circuit. Uh, another way is run towards them and then sort of like a tackle in the NFL, you know, tackle them, get them, to, get them away from that circuit. If you just go over and grab them, that's one of the worst things you can do because your, your instincts lead you to do that, but you're gonna become part of that circuit. And you can clearly see that at, even at 100 to 2,000 milliamps, milliamps, uh, ventricular, ventricular fibrillation can occur, uh, and then over 2,000, definitely cardiac arrest. So be very aware of shock hazards. And, you know, when you run shock hazards and you take a look at current going through a system, power equals current times uh, P equals I times E, so power equals current times voltage. And you can use Ohm's law, E equals I times R also, to determine that to get to that type of current, a very, very small load. So just be very careful. Well, there are some risks from an arc flash. Now, the flash is the initial, initial flash that you see, like a big flash of bright light. Um, and unfortunately, that flash also can cause uh, uh, problems to see uh, in your sight. So it can burn the cornea, uh, wear eye protection, um, the noise blast, extensive. Uh, and that can actually puncture eardrums. So you can see that from the arc flash and blast itself, a lot of damage can occur. Uh, the arc flash is actually created by phase to phase or phase to ground short circuit. So if you're working with three phase uh, voltage or an incoming power into the, into the utility from the, uh, uh, from the service entrance, you can see that if you go phase to phase, uh, that's going to create this type of short circuit between those phases. And we'll talk about ways that you can help mitigate that from happening. But that happens because current passes through the air, the ionized air. So as air, it becomes charged, it becomes ionized. And that's similar to a Jacob's Ladder. If you've ever seen the old Frankenstein movies where they have that little V, current starts at the bottom and then continues upward because of the heat rising. And that's showing you what an actual uh, type of plasma conductor in ionized air actually looks like. Uh, <clears throat> once the arc begins, it feeds off any matter in its path and vaporizes it. So that's where you get the, the 
sort of liquefying of the copper. And the duration, under one second. Immediately, boom, it's gone, it happens. And that's why uh, you have to be just so careful. Here's some examples. So these are the risks that actually take, flat, take place after the arc flash, which initiates this incident, becomes the arc blast. That's that mass of energy that destroys panels, anything in its way. Uh, and our goal here, keep this from ever happening. You don't ever want to be involved in this. We do have some videos on our website. I did not include them in this. If you want more information on that, you can come to our website and take a look at some videos which are interviews from some arc flash survivors. And it's chilling to hear firsthand what happens in these. The explosive result of the arcing fault, its vaporized conductors are rapidly expelled, creating such hazards as intense heat, the heat of the sun, uh, the thermoacoustic shock wave, which pushes back. So it forces you back. And if you're inside a small vault, a small electrical cabinet area, uh, anything, it can push you into other objects, other items that are in that room. Uh, the, that's with the shock wave. The molten metal uh, definitely flies out shrapnel from that, which cuts through a lot of protective clothing. Uh, the blinding light, which uh, could cause blindness and burn the corneas, as we said. The toxic smoke and the contact with energized components. I mean, if you put all this together, it's something none of us ever want to experience. Well, what causes these incidents? Well, there's many different things that actually cause them. Number one, racking a circuit breaker. So if you insert or remove a breaker on a live bus, especially if something is under load, it's going to want to try to conduct across that. And that's where you can actually cross phase to phase. Uh, so be careful to use lockout, proper lockout, tagout, uh, types of uh, instructions from your employer um, and make sure that, that you're protected against that. Uh, and we'll go over some different ways that you can make measurements on a circuit before you take off your PPE. And when we talk about PPE, personal protective equipment, obviously a lot of uh, the different Cal 40 suits or the different Cal suit, depending upon the incident energy in that environment, um, uh, definitely wearing ear protection, eye protection, the correct type of layered clothing, uh, the gloves, uh, and the, the hard part of the glove, the leather part of the glove over the rubber part of the glove. I've seen people make the mistake of taking the, the rubber and putting it over thinking that that protects the leather, but that's not really what you want to do. You would definitely want to protect the rubber part of the, the uh, protective gloves from being cut or damaged, and you have to check for that. Number two, loose panel wiring. So a loose conductor that shorts across another conductor or ground. So that happens in panels all the time, especially if they haven't been PM to prevent maintenance uh, in quite a while and they haven't been shut down and they haven't been torqued correctly. Uh, through vibration in especially older buildings and near subways and other types of of vibration causing equipment that can be nearby, that vibration will loosen wiring and it can actually fall. Um, even when you're taking the panel off to first do your inspection, just taking the panel off can actually cause that to happen. And that leads us to number three, removing panel covers. So the retaining screws and fasteners, they fall into the unsecured panel against a live bus. We've seen it happen. Uh, so be very, very careful with that when you take the panel off. And also, while we're on that, dust and any type of debris. I've seen where um, electricians have reported to us where at one point perhaps there's metal filings in the bottom of the cabinet where somebody has drilled to put in, maybe they've put in a uh, IR window or something into the panel, and unfortunately they do it in such a way that some of the metal filings might be in the bottom of the, can, uh, the cabinet. Um, they don't deactivate it, they disrupt that, or they use compressed air, or something causes those to become airborne, short across the conductors. Instantly, you have that arc flash, arc blast to happen. Hand tool, shorted across two phases, another good one. So experienced electrician cuts into the live cable, 
with cable shears and the shear handle touches another phase. Seen it happen. Uh, we do have a full line of brand new uh, safety gear um, that are uh, protected hand tools up to 1,000 volts AC, 2,000 volts DC, uh, which is important because if you're working on um, any type of solar arrays or any type of solar panels, you need to understand that there's DC uh, voltage as well that these tools have to be rated to. Using incorrect test probes. So test probes are a big deal. Most of the test probes in the middle of the end of the test probe is about three quarters of an inch long. If you can minimize that, you're better because um, that inch long, if you're using two test probes and they become too close together, as in the other video or the other picture, the other slide, uh, it could short across and create that issue. Uh, misuse of measurement tools. So we'll cover that, but uh, measuring across phases with an inline amp meter. An inline amp meter is a direct short, and some people, our products are, are well, they're protected with a fuse, a fast blow fuse in the current ranges. However, you don't know if somebody that you borrowed that meter from didn't bypass that by inserting another type of fuse. And I've even seen where people need to get the current rating or get the current function working on the meter again. They wrap it with a little tin foil and put it back in. Ultimate no-no. <laughs> don't ever do that. Doesn't matter what product you're dealing with. If it has a fuse, put the correct fuse back into that instrument. Um, and make sure you check with the manufacturer's recommendations when you replace that fuse. Measuring continuity on a live circuit with a tool that cannot withstand full voltage, ours can withstand the full source voltage up to 1,000 volts. And we consider that to be low voltage, but it's 1,000 volts. So if you're in the ohms mode, a lot, of, a lot of instruments will create a sort of a short circuit, and that can actually initiate an arc flash, arc blast incident. Uh, they have different FETs, they have different internal protection to keep that from happening, at least in fluke gear they do. Accidental shorting of phases with a test lead tip, that's too long for the safety category, and we'll go over that in a couple minutes. So here's a couple common errors with measurement tools. Here we have uh, making a current measurement in the upper left and a voltage measurement in the lower right. So. You can see the current measurement, uh, inline measurement, and actually you would do that. You see AC voltage, but you separate the circuit, allow the current to come through the meter, uh, lower right where we're measuring a voltage drop or we're measuring across a resistor. Uh, but you can see what happens here, connecting the meter to a voltage source with the meter configured for inline amp measurements, that's a no-no. What happens is, the, again, the amps mode on a meter is almost a short circuit, and so all that current tries to travel through the meter could cause that incident. The next one, measuring ohms or continuity on a live circuit. The older meters can't handle the full voltage on the ohms function. That's very similar to using an analog meter in the ohms function and trying to measure that. You can have a lot of issues. Today's digital meters, uh, most of them, they're, they're good at making that type of measurement, but be very careful, know your instrument, and know how it was tested, and we'll get into that too. There's the good no-go no symbol. So let's talk a little bit about industry guidelines, NFPA 70E. If you haven't read the standard, read the standard. Uh, this protects you. And it, it is governed also in parallel with OSHA. So it is, this is National Fire Protection Association. 70E is the standard. And in this case, safety-related work practices, maintenance of safety equipment, training, the requirements for special equipment, and installation requirements, all covered in the standard. And it's updated as, again, every three years. One of the areas is PPE. Now, Fluke doesn't make PPE uh, that you see on the left. We talked to Salisbury. They granted us access to this image. Um, but whatever you choose, whatever type of protective equipment, it is rated, according to the standards, in different ARC ratings 
for the PPE. There's 4 cal, 8 cal, 25, and 40. 40 being the most bulky, the heaviest, best protection for you. And it shows the layers um, and the number of the PPE category. Obviously, the higher the electrical environment, the stronger the personal protective environment or equipment must be to withstand that arc flash incident. Uh, this is spelled out, and there are formulas in NFPA 70E that take, take into account the incident energy, the total energy you're measuring, the distance you are, the amount of force that would be there, and it gives you all the measurements and the type of cal suits that you need to wear. Follow those instructions. I know that uh, some experienced electricians, I've seen them where they say, I'm only in the panel for a few seconds. And face it, these things are bulky. They're heavy. They're hot. Um, and, uh, you know, but they protect you. So it's like driving down the road without your seatbelt. Okay, you can do it, but you don't really want to. Um, there's a lot of protection that's there to help you. You can see on the right side, those are the tools that Fluke just recently introduced. We have a wide range of different uh, long nose pliers. There's uh, side cutters in there. There's a lineman plier set. Uh, we have uh, a lot of different types of screwdrivers. These are double insulated with uh, a lot of safety in mind, again, up to that, over that 1,000 volts. So take a look at those. Uh, you should be using some type of insulated hand tools when you're working around electrical. So we have some flash limits of approach, safe working distances. So in the first one is where you have the exposed conductors. You can see the panel that's open, and there are boundaries. The furthest, furthest most boundary is called the arc flash boundary. Now you can see someone just standing there. Yeah, they have a hard hat and probably earring, ear protection and eye protection, but it's not a cow suit. Uh, but they're dressed accordingly for the environment. But you can also see the barrier put in place. Uh, that's the furthest most barrier, and that would be your responsibility as well if you're going into this electrical safety area. And the boundaries apply when workers are exposed to energized electrical conductors or circuit parts. Let's take a look at the next one, which is called the limited space. And there's a limited approach boundary. And that's also based on the amount of experience that you have and the type of personal protective equipment that you have on. There's also the restricted space. So if you don't have the training that you need, if you don't have the correct PPE, if you don't have the correct tools, no one should go into the restricted space. That's really the highest amount of incident energy that can be pushed out if there were an incident to happen. So there are parts of PPE that I'll call out. This is Article 110.4 of the Test Instruments and Equipment part of NFPA 70E, the 2018 edition. A, testing, only qualified persons, so get that, qualified persons shall perform tasks such as testing, troubleshooting, and voltage measuring on electrical equipment operating at voltage equal or greater than 50 volts. It's spelled out in the, in the standard. Now, what makes them qualified? They have to understand not only the equipment they're testing and the process to use, but they also need to understand the equipment that they're using to make that measurement. So make sure that if you borrow a piece of equipment from somebody or take it out of the tool crib that you're fully knowledgeable on how that instrument functions. That's the employer's responsibility to make sure any of the people that are in that facility are using the correct type of equipment, and they have that knowledge. Rating. So test instruments, equipment, and their accessories shall be as follows. Rated for the circuits and equipment where they'll utilize. And we'll get into the ratings in just a second. But part of that is also voltage ratings. If you're working on big three-phase um, category, let's say category two, um, or category three, which is a fixed load three-phase, um, you need to have the right voltage and category rating of the equipment to make sure you can use it in that environment because that will help protect against an arc flash or blast. We'll talk about that. Uh, approved for the purpose. So 
there are certain pieces of equipment that aren't approved for a purpose, such as non-contact voltage detectors um, can be used in many cases around electrical, obviously to tell you if a circuit is hot or not. However, you want to make a direct, uh, direct voltage measurement when you go up to a conductor after putting on the uh, lockout tagout before you take off your PPE gear. Again, we'll get into that and I'll show you some, some tricks you might play there with it uh, that are approved and some equipment that you'd be interested in. And also, ratings should be used in accordance with any instructions provided clearly by the manufacturer. Here's another one, C, design. Test instruments, equipment, and their accessories shall be designed for the environment to which they will be exposed and for the manner in which they'll be utilized. Some equipment is not designed for the high energy environments. Be very careful. Even though they'll make a voltage measurement, you wouldn't want to use a very small pocket meter, for instance, with very small conductor leads that aren't rated for that environment. Will they work? Will they measure voltage? Yes, they do measure voltage. Would I use them in that environment? No, because they're not rated for that environment and accidents can happen if you do use them. Visual inspection and repair, that's another one. So you want to look at the equipment. It's up to you uh, to look at the equipment, make sure that it's not cracked, broken, doesn't have any exposed metal on the leads, uh, that the test leads are in great working shape, um, that the insulation hasn't been cut with them. Uh, you want to make sure that the display works, all the digits are, are apparent when you look at the display. So test instruments and equipment and all associated test leads, cables, power cords, probes, and connectors shall be visually inspected for external defects and damage before each use. Uh, and, and really, that's good rule of thumb. It doesn't matter what environment you're working in. Uh, when I use a meter, you know, test Test it, take a look at it, especially if you haven't used it in a while. Batteries can go flat, incidents can happen. You can even find ways to test the fuses in the instrument, um, and there's ways to do that on fluke instruments without opening them up. Okay, now this one is part of, they're part of PPE. So this is an OSHA requirement, 1910.335. It does require insulated hand tools. So Maximizing on the insulation between the active conductor, not only in the test instrument, but you can also see they're wearing the correct PPE glove. And again, the leather on the outside, rubber on the inside to protect them. When working near exposed energized conductors, uh, use the insulated hand tools. And that's very important. Uh, otherwise, what you're doing with a standard screwdriver or a standard set of pliers the uh, amount of exposed metal. You can see in this case, uh, all that insulation, the red insulation on the shank of the screwdriver extends almost all the way down to the tip, minimizing the amount of exposed metal. Remember, you're trying to guard against any arc flash or arc, arc blast incident. This is part of what we call live dead live testing, LDL. And it, again, it's part of the standard. Um, part of that 110.4, and this is called a proving unit. And what this is, is a source for voltage uh, up to 240 volts. So part of the standard tells you that you need to first take your instrument and verify its operation against a known voltage source. So that's what this little portable device, that little square box on the left does. Uh, and they're not that expensive, they're, they're not at all. Uh, and they generate, they have batteries inside, they generate either AC or DC volts. In this case, if you're gonna make a measurement on a panel and it's AC volts, what you can do is, especially if it's been lockout tagout, if you've done lockout tagout and you're trying to cut the power to that whole cabinet, chances are you've cut power to anywhere where you can make a satisfactory known voltage source measurement. Um, and that includes electrical receptacles. Most of the time they don't have electrical receptacles right in the area where the panels are. That's why if you have this little device in your bag, you just pull it out. It does have a tool pack installed. See that hanging magnet? You can hang it on the panel, make the measurement on there, then they make the measurement 
to an unknown source and then make a measurement to the known source. That's all you need to do. So again, you measure the known source, make sure that the meter is working and configured correctly, then go ahead and measure the unknown source, and then go back and measure the known source again on the proving unit. Now in this case, as we said, convenient electrical outlet, um, access to the live conductors. First of all, if you do use an actual live voltage source, you definitely need to have the suitable PPE. Um, I would personally recommend the suitable PPE until you verify that you don't have any, any power on, on that circuit um, until no power exists. But then you would have to wear the PPE, you measure that voltage, uh, then once you measure that there's no voltage on the circuit, and measure all of the parts of the circuit. A lot of panels are dual feed. You may not know that someone else put a different feed into this circuit panel and you pull the main breaker or you do a lockout and you test one part of the circuit and you say, ah, oh, that panel's great. Test multiple areas because if somebody else put another feed in there that you missed, that can still backfeed into that circuit and cause that catastrophic voltage source. And then when you re-verify that the meter was working correctly after it said zero, then you can take off your PPE and be safe touching parts of that circuit. And that's what that PRV240, that's the proving unit. Um, and again, they work with multimeters, clamps, all of that. So that's a pretty good device. A bottom line. Safety first. So the best practices include, whenever possible, obviously work on de-energized circuits and follow the proper lockout-tagout procedures. Number two, use well-maintained tools and the appropriate personal protective equipment according to NFPA 70E. The safety glasses, insulated tools, gloves, um, all of this, insulating mats, and, and, and I know people don't always have the proper equipment there and they're bulky and not always easy to put on, um, make, sure, make sure that you do. Um, I'm sort of a stickler on that. Uh, maybe I'm old school, but um, when I've seen some of these, the results from these incidents, you'll be glad that you did. Don't work alone. Tell somebody where you're going to be working. Have somebody else in that area. Work out a plan for escaping that area in case there is an incident or whatever's going to happen. Uh, make sure that you go in prepared. Um, so have your meeting up front, make sure you talk it over so you know what everyone's task and role is. Practice safe measurement techniques. Always connect the grounded lead first, hot second, and then disconnect the hot lead first and the grounded lead second. Always a good rule of thumb. Um, and use live dead live testing. Test the known circuit, measure the target circuit, and test the renown, the, the other circuit. Uh, there's also some other ones, and, and some of those is don't use two hands. Obviously, if you measure two hands to make a circuit measurement, one on ground, and you're touching the leads, if one's on ground and one's other, and the other one's on a hot source, um, what happens is if there is any possible uh, contact of that conductor, and then current travels through your body, we get back to measurement safety of shock. Uh, that that shock and that high energy can travel up one arm through your heart down to the other arm and stops your heart. So they always tell you to use one hand when making the measurement and we have test lead holders built into the holsters. We have hanging tools. Uh, it's always a good practice. They, uh, electricians typically say, hey, put one hand in your pocket and they do that so that you're not apt to grab one hand uh, to steady yourself or use it for another area and provide that current path to ground. Ensure that the test equipment meets or exceeds industry standards. Okay, let's talk a little bit about International Electrotechnical Commission. That was easy for me to say. Uh, that is called IEC 61010. It's actually 61010-2, and it's a group standard for low voltage test measurement and control equipment. And this is governing all equipment 1,000 volts or less, so it includes 480, 600 volt, three-phase circuits. And we'll talk a little bit about what that is. Um, so in, in an electrical circuit, if 
you can have an actual transient that takes place caused by load switching, um, sort of a disconnect of incident power. Um, a good way to understand that, man, when I was younger, I used to work on cars all the time, and I think everyone has probably experienced a time when the lawnmower, for instance, wouldn't shut off. So what do you do? <laughs> you reach down and pull the spark plug wire. No, you don't want to do, really do that. Uh, you'll feel that, that shock that comes through on that spark plug wire. Um, or a horn relay. When a horn is honking and you energize this electromagnet, which causes a horn to honk, and then you disconnect on the switch, counter EMF, counter voltage can actually produce this high energy shock that is counter to the direction of current flow, and it re-energizes the system momentarily. These shocks are milliseconds in length, or in fact, may last even microseconds, but can be extremely dangerous. And you can see there, a, sp a uh, spike can be up to 8,000 or more voltage, more volts, that rides on the sine wave that you see there. Uh, so 480 volts RMS, and it's 678 volt peaks in this incident, in, in what we're showing. Uh, and it can be caused, again, a motor or inductive load switching off, equipment malfunction, utility load switching, adjustable speed drives, lightning strike. Lightning strikes are a very big one. So if you're working outdoors uh, and you're not protected with that, you're going to take the full amount of energy if it strikes a conductor if you're making a measurement on that conductor outdoors. So let's take a look at some of the measurement categories and ratings that we have. And they define really three different measurement locations or categories. And pay special attention to the closer you are to the utility's supply, supply where all of the energy comes from, from the utility, like the service entrance or even outside at the transformer, um, the higher the available fault current and the higher the category, because that's also the higher amount of, cur of current that you can likely be subjected to. So first, let's start there. Let's talk about category four, which is the utility supply. There you can see the big uh, cabinets that, where the service entrance comes into the building. You can see the transformers. Now this is the secondary side of the transformer, not primary. We don't do primary voltage testing. That would be from the utility with all the massive voltage from um, uh, the actual utility coming in. But on the secondary side where it comes into the facility, that can be the thousand or less. We're really concerned about that. And that would be three phase at utility connection. And we also put in there any outdoor mains conductor. What does that mean? Well, it means that if you have an outdoor building Somewhere it's being fed from the service entrance or the utility connection to the facility. And they've run the cabling and they've run the power outdoors to this outside building, let's say. And it might be, it could even be a lower amount of voltage, 110 volts that you're making the measurement for. The problem with that is if there's a lightning strike or this load switching, it's going to find the best path to ground, even if that passed through you. And if you're outside, there's nothing really standing in the way of it doing that. And that's why it's very dangerous when you make the measurements. You have to make sure that you use a category four rated instrument if you're working in those conditions. Let's look at cap three. So you can see there that we have some pumps and motors that are cap three fixed mount loads. We have cap three, there's a variable frequency drive, 240 volt cabinet. We have category three 208 and 120 volt uh, uh, distribution panel for typically for lighting or any fixed loads. Those are three phase distribution including single phase commercial loading, lighting. Uh, so that's again further into the facility, into the building. The building's wiring itself will start to add some capacitance and start to absorb some of that high energy if it comes in on the service, en the service entrance. However, it doesn't dissipate all of that. So you're still subject to a lot of energy that can cause that arc flash, arc blast incident. Category two, that's down at the single phase plug-in loads. Uh, you would need definitely a category two rated instrument. Now, you could use a category four in multiple locations, like in category three or two, you can still use a category four instrument. 
just can't go backwards. You can't use the category two outside, for instance. There's also mixed mixed categories. So you can use a cat cat three thousand volt, cat four six hundred volt rated instrument, uh, and that's one of the highest ratings that we have, like our eighty seven dash five great meter, um, and that's that's rated at that range. So. Um, make sure you research where, you know, what type of rating you use. And this, this also lists it. So the working voltage can be 1,000 volts, 600 or 300. So make sure that you understand the voltage you're working on and the location that you're working. That helps you understand where you're working with the right type of instrument. And all manufacturers have category ratings on their instrument. It's something that they put on themselves. So you also want to note, uh, well, first of all, where is that rating? It's near the inputs to the instrument, whether it's a lab scope or a DMM or an insulation tester. Right between the, the uh, where the test leads plug in, you'll see, for instance, this one, CAT 3000 volt, CAT 4 600 in the upper left. Um, and many of our instruments are rated that high. Uh, I mentioned about it's, it's sort of this standard that a manufacturer puts it on. The other thing you need to do is to look at the ratings of the instruments, CE and TUV and UL, and what are the ratings of the instrument from independent labs, and also follow and follow the instructions from the manufacturer on that piece of equipment. What if you can't find a rating? Now, not all instruments are rated. Some of the older ones are no longer rated. Do they measure well? Sure. Yeah, I can still get a voltage reading, and I can still get a current reading. Should I be using them? No, because the amount of current and some of the big motors that we're working with now, some of the huge loads that we're working with now, they're different from ever before. So they were developed, these meters were actually made at a time when they'll still make the measurement and they're still accurate, but they don't have the internal protection that you're granted by using this uh, category rating system. So some of these can be listed, but not designed to. So a manufacturer spends a lot of money to build in this protection. So look for the UL, CU, CSA, TUV uh, ratings on the back of the meters. Uh, and also, uh, just make sure that they've been independently tested because that's sort of the watch guard for the industry uh, to make sure someone doesn't rate something that it just doesn't meet. Yeah, here you can see Fluke, we devote 10 to 15 percent of the components exclusively to protection inside that instrument from high energy fuses, fast blow, to the category, to overload protection. And speaking of fuses, these are special fuses. They're actually filled with sand uh, on purpose because what happens in an arcing incident, uh, if that fuse blows, uh, what happens is if you used a glass fuse, all of that conductor inside the fuse would be blown against the inside of the glass tube and high voltage or high current could still jump between those shards of little pieces of metal and still not break you from that circuit. That's why we invest heavily in very special fuses that we've designed that we get from BUS um, that protect you and that instrument. If there is one that goes open, it does so for a certain reason. Um, it is in sand. It actually melts the sand, turns it into glass. It cuts off all available oxygen. Uh, you don't have a chance of having any arc flash or arc blast incident. Test leads, let's talk a little bit about that. So there's some things you need to look at with test leads. One of those is the category rating. So it's not just the instrument. Make sure that the test leads are also rated as high as that environment. So look for that CAT3, CAT4. They're using some TL175, and I'll show you those leads in a second. Um, you can see the one on the left, the black lead that the gentleman or the person is holding. Uh, has about three-quarter inch exposed metal. The one on the right has a much smaller amount. These are special leads that you rotate and it changes the category rating to a higher rating by minimizing the amount of exposed metal. So you also want to look at the leads themselves. 
These are actually shot in two different ways. So in the rubber that's used uh, on the, the silicon rubber that's used on the insulation, it's shot double. So the inner, inner part is white, the outer part is the red or black. That way, if it's ever cut or nicked, all you have to do is run it past your finger, and you'll, if you see white on the lead, don't use it, because you know that the insulation's been damaged. And we'll go to the next one. So here are the leads. You can see them on the right. It goes down to four millimeters, which is only 16 uh, thousandths of an inch, or 16 one hundredths of an inch there. Um, and three quarters of an inch uh, on the category two, uh, and you can rotate that little shield to, to match your environment. If you don't have those leads, we do include uh, some little tip guards that you snap on the end of the probe, and it helps protect you. And also look for the right angle test probes uh, to be plugged in, or the, the jacketed probes to be plugged into the meter. <coughs> Sorry because that helps protect them from pulling away from the meter. Well, let's talk about non-contact volt detectors for a second. So non-contact volt detectors, I never go anywhere without them. I mean, these things are great, um, especially when just trying to tell you if something is hot or not. Now, they can probably be used very safely to detect if there is voltage. Um, <coughs> and the way that they work is they you first want to verify the voltage detector is working properly, so you can test the known circuit, um, and it will light up on the, for instance, in an electrical receptacle in the U.S., uh, the short one goes on the black wire, that goes your hot wire, goes back to the panel. It will use your body's uh, resistance and go ahead and a path to ground. So it will um, uh, light up if it makes contact or if it, if it detects voltage on that little short blade on the, on the side of the electrical receptacle. On the longer one is the neutral, and then the ground obviously is the round one. They both terminate back at the panel. One's one shielded, one isn't, uh, but they shouldn't have the current going on them, so they shouldn't light up. Uh, but make sure the, re the detector is rated for the level of voltage that you're going to be measuring. So if it's the 1,000 volts and under, Make sure you wear the appropriate PPE. These are designed to even light up if you're wearing the insulated gloves. They'll still work. Um, and make sure the hazardous voltage or the line is not shielded. If it is shielded, you may not be able to make this non-contact measurement. So that's pretty important. Also, <laughs> use only a digital multimeter or contact type tester if you're testing for that absence of voltage. Making a physical connection is really the best way. Now, with that said, Fluke just introduced something that is really awesome. This is the T6-1000, um, and you'll see on the display this has two indications. One is current, which we've used open jaw current technology and detection systems for many years now to look at the current traveling through that conductor. But if you're in a crowded raceway or you're in a J-box or you're somewhere where you can't necessarily take a take a voltage measurement, you still want to measure voltage because you want to find out what the issues are in that circuit. Um, this product is the first one in a series that we're introducing that uses something called field sense, which is a technology that's built into the jaw of the instrument, and it can actually display accurately the voltage as well as the current without making any direct contact to the conductor inside. Yeah, let me repeat it, without actually making that direct contact, because that's critical, especially for electrical safety. Um, so if you haven't seen this, definitely take a look at the T6000. Now the 600 is great. The 600 does not have the dual reading display, the 1000 does. So um, I would look at the T6000 if you're interested. A couple other things that can help, help keep you safer in a lot of these environments. You know, Fluke has pioneered a lot of remote reading meters. There are some others on the market. Um, we also have uh, some uh, Fluke Connect capabilities where we can make a measurement in a crowded panel, reactivate it, and then through a closed panel, we can look at a screen, at a screen or display 
<coughs> that is removed from the instrument, so we're back in a safer position outside that, that incident energy zone to look at what voltage or current is actually flowing. So I recommend if you spend your life in front of this loaded cannon, take a look at these, these either meters, current clamps, or other products that employ this type of safety. Uh, here we have a Fluke Connect, so that actually sends the readings through low power, low power Bluetooth from a lot of our instruments and a lot of the readings directly to a phone or a computer or up to the cloud for monitoring and access later. But you're outside that zone, so that becomes a much safer way to make that measurement. Uh, here you can see somebody was using the Fluke Connect um, and we actually have this gentleman, this is a real gentleman, not an actor, of somebody that used this product, um, and it saved him from an arcing incident. Um, in this case, he was measuring three phase, uh, and again, you can look at logging these over time and then play back the logging. Um, they're great tools. Another thing, infrared cameras. So I wanted to have a chance to talk to you about these because infrared really remains one of the first watch, watches that you have for looking at where you might have an incident energy issue. So if you have a loose conductor, excessive current, or if you have uh, one phase that's dropping out or has minimal current going through it, infrared really works well to detect where the problems may be. Uh, and we have a brand new camera, in fact, you can see that gentleman is using it. It's a smaller one, sort of pop, use it in your pocket, but it, it's a very high resolution for that one. So you might even take a look at all of the different types of, of infrared you have available to you. The prices are coming down on these. Uh, they're fairly easy to use, um, but they really work well to help get you on the right track. Here's using infrared to sort of look at that invisible with infrared. You can see on the left how we have a one circuit that appears to be drawing excessive current, um, uh, the one on the far left. Uh, and in this case, if it were a lighting circuit or where you can see in the distribution panel, you can see where there's excessive current or on the breaker of the one further to the right. Many times you'll see where um, somebody added some circuits and put it under a breaker that might be close to tripping. So you can identify nuisance tripping with those as well. You can also do things like on pole mounted transformers to see oil levels and things like that and tank levels. If you're using infrared, take a look at infrared windows. These are not glass. This is a silicon type of a, a crystalline element. Uh, that allows infrared to pass through, otherwise infrared is reflective to glass. So these are blast proof, they're, they're rated for the environment. They can be permanently mounted in a panel. So you can see this gentleman's making the measurement without suiting up in the heavy PPE. Why? Because he's still protected through the use of this panel and he's able to look at the conductors inside and run his PE without shutting down the panel. These are great. So if you have a number of different switches and, and panels and disconnects, these can be mounted in a matter of moments, and they're great tools. So uh, just a couple more things here. First of all, NFPA states that employees shall be trained to select an appropriate test instrument for a given task, demonstrate how to use the instrument, interpret the result, understand the ratings of the test instrument, perform a visual inspection of the test instrument and the accessories, perform an operational verification on a known voltage source, and identify misapplication. Uh, so we talked about a lot of those. Uh, we do have some online courses. There's a four-hour course that's electrical measurement safety. I know it's great. I designed it. <laughs> that's my one plug. Um, and that is on our website free of charge, that's our offer to the industry. Uh, you can go at, you sign up for that at that URL right there, user.fact, F-A-C-T, that's the Fluke Academy of Certified Training, .fluke.com, or you can go to the Fluke website and under uh, train or learn, 
and online courses, it's right there. But we have some other courses as well. So we have insulation resistance testing and digital multimeter basics, motor drive troubleshooting. All of those are no charge. Um, I urge you to definitely become knowledgeable with it. And then finally, the next steps when implementing a safety program, what do you have to do? Complete some type of online training course or some type of in-person training course for electrical measurement safety. Critical that you understand it. Match your working environment to the CAT rating of your tools. Audit your test tool inventories. Take a look at the test tools. Make sure that they're rated correctly, that they're in good working order, that you're using them in the right place in the right time. Stock some spare parts like leads and test leads, uh, fuses. And then finally, make training and briefings part of your daily work. And here I put in a, just a little brief meter scorecard so you can see if they pass or fail. And we're to the giveaway, just under the hour. This is great. So if there are any questions, I didn't leave a lot of time, please let us know. Awesome. Thank you so much, Corey and Sloop. We really appreciate it. So it looks like we do have a question on our WebEx panel here. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll shoot that over to you now, Corey, and we'll see if we can answer it. So you ready? It just says, the okay. use of 240 proving units to validate DMM is in accordance with 1110.4? Yes, it is. Okay, perfect. Yeah, the PRV 240. We also have a PRV, PRV 240 for the Fluke Connect or for the Field Sense. Uh, so there is one if you're using a um, uh, this device that you see right here, the T6-1000, we have a proving unit that works with that one as well. So there are two different ones. Thank you. Thank you, David Rockwell, for submitting that question. And we just have one more has from Jamie Hawkins. Has the two rating been eliminated? Two rating hasn't, one has. So in other words, category. if he's referring to category one, uh, category one was mixed voltage. That was eliminated uh, probably four or five years ago. Uh, and that was um, still one of the lowest ratings, and that was dealing with mixed voltages in a single location, such as um, uh, in a copier where you might have high voltage in a laser um, printer uh, as mixed with low voltage that they would call category one. It was then changed to category zero or O for other, and then they dropped it all together. Okay. Oh, I apologize. I see Jamie actually edited their question, and they said they meant the two star. Two star. I guess I'm not familiar with that. Um, if you send me uh, his email address separately, I'll be glad to get back, and we'll, we'll sort through that. Awesome. Thank you so much. And now I think it's time to announce our giveaway winner. Yes! <laughs> Woo! All right, drum roll. So it looks like our winner is Derek Heitzman. So Derek, we have your email address, so we will reach out to you about the best way to get this to you. So awesome. Thank you. Congratulations. So Congrats. Thank you, Flu. Thank you, Corey. And for more information, uh, please visit mscdirect.com backslash bettermro. And I want to thank you all for your time today. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you again for joining us today. This concludes today's web conference. You may now disconnect. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.